السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وصلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم تسليما كثيرا الحمد لله رب العالمين We return back to our topic our very important topic that we introduced last lesson to do with the hearts, to do with the health of the hearts. And we said that the title of the book that we were taking, that we're taking this journey on Al-Bahr Ra'iq fi zuhdi wa Raqa'iq, Sheikh Ahmed Farid. And we briefly spoke about and introduced what it means, what's a zuhd and we took some examples of the salaf giving the definition of this word as zuhd and we understood in that brief lesson that a zahid the one that is in reality he is free from this dunya a zahid and this was the condition of the Prophet ﷺ. This was the condition of the companions. This was the condition of the Salaf, our pious predecessors, that they were Zahideen. They were living in this dunya, but their hearts were with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Their hearts were with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the dunya that they lived in was in their hands was in their hands and this is actually another definition of a zuhud to have the dunya in your hand and not in your heart and we want to clear up a misconception about the definition or the understanding of the word a zuhud it is not to say that a person is not involved in this dunya or it's not the understanding that a person cannot live in this dunya and have money and cannot live in this dunya and be successful and cannot live in this dunya and be wealthy as a matter of fact that's not the understanding because there were many greats and Ibn Mubarak is one of those great ulama these great giants that came before us that wrote books that were titled as Zuhd, but were wealthy as well. And before him, there came the companions, and from them, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, and from them, Abu Bakr al Siddiq, and from them, and from them, many that had a lot of money, but were they defined to be Zahideen? Were they defined to have the characteristic of a Zuhd? Yes, of course. Yes, of course. And before the companions, we take from the Anbiya, Dawood alayhi salam, Sulaiman alayhi salam, not just money, kingship in kingdoms, muluk. They, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, had given them like Sulaiman or had combined for them kingship and wealth, something that had not been given to anyone else. But was Sulaiman alayhi salam min al-Zahideen? Of course. Of course. Subhanallah, which Nabi from Al-Anbiya was not. So it's the wrong concept, the wrong understanding to think, I'm a Zahid, I want to be a Zahid. And remember, we're going back to the title of the book. It's wrong to think that you are a zahid and you cannot take from this dunya. No, 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 no. Take. That's, that's no problem. If you are successful and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you success in this dunya and you are wealthy and you're able to use that wealth and this is where the catch is, this is where the line should be drawn, then use that wealth in order to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Use that wealth in order to 
become a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the one that has a lot of this wealth and is successful in the dunya, but the dunya is in his heart and not in his hand. This is now when the definition of a zahid and the definition of a zuhid cannot really be applied. Cannot really be applied. Because the main characteristic between the great pious predecessors and a lot of us today is that when something was taken away from them in the dunya, they said, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Even if it was a big amount of wealth, of health, of whatever it may be from success, they said, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, and they made peace with the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the qadr. So to clear up that definition, because a lot of us might think that to be a zahid, it's similar to the concept of you know, sleeping in the mosque or staying in a place of worship and not being uh, at all involved in society. That's not the concept. That's not the concept. The concept is that your heart is free from the shackles of this dunya. As the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Sijnul mu'min ad dunya. And it's the Jannah for who? The kafir. For the Prophet, ﷺ, he was he had access to wealth. He had access to plenty of wealth. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he told him in Surah Al Duha, as we heard. Allah, he was faqir. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he gave him. But that still didn't stop the Prophet ﷺ on sleeping or from sleeping on the straw mat and from Amr anhu crying from that picture. And that goes to show you that the Prophet ﷺ was the greatest uh, concept or the greatest example of a zahid. And he said it in a hadith. He said, what is it that I need from this dunya? What is it that I want from this dunya? I am but only what? A person. Or similar to a person that takes shelter under a tree. And then soon after, I continue my path. Subhanallah. Yani, this concept by itself. Yani, literally, the Prophet ﷺ is not telling us, go and rest under a tree and then keep walking. That's, that's not the concept. The concept is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught the Prophet ﷺ and he's teaching us that this should be what's in your heart. Don't be attached to the dunya. Don't be attached to the dunya. A zahid and a person that practices correct zuhud, when he looks at the dunya, he looks at it with a realistic eye. He understands that the wealth and the health that he has and the lineage and the children and everything that he has, it is not really for him. He does not own it. It is only alone. He's renting. He's renting like the house that you rent or like the equipment that you rent or like the things that you rent. You give them back. But there, we will leave that example, but we must touch on it in order that we understand that a zuhd does not mean that you cannot have wealth and you cannot be successful. Rather, understand the difference between the two, inshallah. We continue... Tonight we speak about this great topic of a zuhud. And we want to move on very, very briefly and shortly to the next part of the title. And the word al-raqa'iq, it comes from the word raqiq, which is something to be soft. Which is something to be soft. And it really needs no detailed explanation. For the one that is Zahid, the one that is Zahid, then he is a person or she is a person that their heart is softened by the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and by the remembrance of the Akhirah. And the topics, the different topics that we are going to venture off in this book are topics that must, inshallah, penetrate those hard hearts. Because every single one of us, whether we want to admit it or not, our hearts are hard. Or there is hardness in our hearts, at least. And that is due to the dunya that we live in. And that is due to 
the many fitan, the many different trials that we go through daily, weekly, yearly in our life. And the reason that this topic is so important is that a believer cannot live his life without penetrating that hard heart, without constantly reviving that heart. And we said recently that the Prophet ﷺ, he told us in a hadith, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to what? To jaddid al-iman, to revive for you the iman in your heart. Why is that so? Because the Prophet ﷺ, he said, because verily the iman, it becomes rusty or it becomes old and worn just as a garment becomes old and worn. Subhanallah. Yani the Prophet وسلم, he's giving us a cure from weak or for weak iman. And you find this in this hadith, there are many different lessons. From the first lessons, is that we need to be asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a dua. And there is a section that is going to be given specifically for a dua. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to jaddad the iman. My brother and sister in Islam, the iman... It cannot by itself just be fixed or be better or be refueled. It needs the aid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it needs work from us as well. So, these are from the reasons insha'Allah that we are going to be going through these different topics insha'Allah. Now, we want to speak about today... Something in relation to obviously the heading and the topic. And the heart itself is in direct contact with or in direct connection with a nafs. With the nafs. And many of us have heard this, this word before, the nafs. Translated to be the soul. Translated to be the soul, the nafs. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has spoken in the Qur'an about the nafs in different ways. And that's why our ulama have categorized the different types of nafs or anfus. And from the most popular types, there are three. There are three different types of nafs. The first one is the nafs that's the amara. The nafs that's the amara. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Yusuf where the wife of Al-Aziz when she realizes that the plot and the scam against Yusuf alayhi salam had been uncovered. And now the truth had come out and the wife of Al-Aziz now, yani she had to uh, give in and tell the truth. What did she say? She said, وَمَا أُبَرِّئُ نَفْسِ إِنَّ النَّفْسَ لَأَمَّارَةً بِالصُّوءِ And this first type of nafs, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes it as an amara. An amara. And there's a difference between amira and amara. Amiratun, amaratun. And the amara here is something described in the Arabic language that is continuous and a lot. Continuous and a lot. And here... The wife of Al-Aziz, she's confessing that the nafs, the soul, it is a constant caller to transgression. A constant caller to what? To transgression and sin. And this, my brother and sister in Islam, is a point of reflection for you and I. To know and to understand that that's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you and I. إِلَّا مَنْ رَحِمَ اللَّهِ as the verse it continues at the end, except for if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has mercy on you, and you're from those really, really righteous people, 
And obviously, the Anbiya and the Rusul are obviously an exception here. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described the nafs to be a creation that continuously wants from you to transgress. It needs to be disciplined. And you find it from yourself. You only need to look at your own self. You only need to look at your own soul, day in and day out. To understand that when one sin is done, subhanallah, it's like a roller coaster. When one door is opened for sin, subhanallah, more sin, easy. One look is done, subhanallah, another look. One word is said, subhanallah, easy to say another thing that is wrong. And that's why Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, he said, the nafs, it is like a child, subhanallah. It's like a child. If you show it that you are serious and that you want to discipline it, it gives in to you. But if you let it go to do what it wants, then it takes over you, subhanallah. It takes over you. And that's why this whole religion, the whole religion of Islam, if we were to follow it properly in the way that the Prophet ﷺ had followed or had taught, then you would realize that you are in constant discipline of your soul. 24-7. And that's why sometimes the disbelievers, they can't understand. They can't fathom when they see this religion, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had closed and sealed their hearts. Allah had sealed their hearts. They ask you, well they ask you from the questions, and I've been asked many, why do you have to pray five times a day? When you're in your workplace, or when you're in your, uh, in your school, or your study place, or whatever, your college, in your uni, they realize, they see you. Praying Dahar, praying Asar, making sure that the time is ready, you're there. And they ask you, why is it so difficult? You have to always pray. And then when Ramadan comes, why do you have to fast? Why is it that you cannot drink water at least? Why is it that you must, and you refrain from all of this? But they don't realize that subhanallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had told us that the nafs is an ammara. The soul, it needs to be tamed. And what's a better way than to tame it in those five prayers? Didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell us that the salat tanha an al fahshai wal munkar? The salat tanha an madha an al fahshai wal munkar. It, it helps you to stay away from transgression. Yani, it helps you to make that soul obedient. It helps you to what? Discipline that soul. And that's why the reality, the reality of the of the salat. If it is not taking you away from al-fahsha wal-munkar, then there is an issue. Then there is a problem, subhanAllah. And obviously, al-siyam, from the greatest worships, la'allakum madha, the reason, la'allakum tattaqoon, in order that you may reach taqwa. And this taqwa, it is only reached after when? After you have disciplined your soul. For that so-and-so time from dusk to dawn, refraining from what is halal, then obviously it is easy for you to refrain from, refrain from what is haram. As the ulama, they said, how can a person that refrains from what I have made halal, how can it be hard for him to refrain from what is haram? And this is from the greatest wisdoms that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had put in the different worships. The point of the story is that this nafs, it is an amara basu, continuously, continuously asking you and motivating you to do the haram. And that's why the reason we have chosen to speak about and nafs today is for us to know why is it that we are even speaking about why do we need to dwell into the matters of the heart? Because if the nafs is causing you transgression, then without a shadow of a doubt, the heart is polluted. The heart is polluted. The heart is diseased. The heart is sick. 
And we need to learn in our journey, insha'Allah, how do we revive that heart? What are the things that I need to do, insha'Allah, to get out from the condition that I am in? And I can promise you, Allahu Alam, that none of us are free from this. And if you are, subhanAllah. If you are, subhanAllah. Alhamdulillah. But I doubt that it is the vast majority, subhanAllah. So this is the first type. This is the first type. The nafs that it is an amara. And also we find in Surah Al-Ma'idah, and we know the well-known story of Adam alayhi salam and his sons Habil wa Qabil. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the example of the nafs again in this particular part of the Qur'an. Subhanallah. That this nafs again, so here again, the nafs is the perpetrator. The nafs is the one that is transgressing. This nafs, it was the reason that it caused the two brothers to fight and transgress. And not just transgress, to murder. To murder, subhanallah. The first sin on earth, it was due to what? It was due to the, the transgression of the nafs itself, subhanallah. Fa, al nafs madha, ammaratun bisu. And also the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he told us in one hadith narrated by a tirmidhi, he says, A'udhu bika min madha? A'udhu bika min sharri, na, sharri nafsi. وَمِنْ شَرِّ الشَّيْطَانِ وَشِرْكِهِ Subhanallah. But we know from the small suwar also in the Qur'an, from Juz Amma, we know Surah An-Nas, قُلْ عَضُوا بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ مَلِكِ النَّاسِ إِلَاهِ النَّاسِ مِنْ شَرِّ الْوَسْوَاسِ الْخَنَّاسِ أَلَّذِي يُوَسْوِسُ فِي صُدُورِ النَّاسِ يعني في نفوس الناس أَلَّذِي يُوَسْوِسُ فِي صُدُورِ النَّاسِ يعني في نفوس الناس and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he knew this. And that's why this dua is a further proof to show us that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself is seeking refuge from the, uh, from the sharr, from the evil of the soul. And the reality is, the reality is, after we look at a hadith like this, again, that... These souls that we are talking about, they are only yani, fixed by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one lesson we take from this hadith from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is that again, you need to be asking refuge. You need to be seeking refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the transgression of your nafs. How many people, how many people, believers and disbelievers, they have a transgressive soul. They do a lot of transgression. They do a lot of sin, a lot of bad deeds. Muslims, non-believers, they are always prone to doing evil, wrong. And they are going to everyone and they are seeking advice from everyone, doctors and counselors and psychologists, etc., etc., medication, etc., etc., which may give you a band-aid or give you some type of relief. But the reality is, my brother and sister in Islam, that if this person is a disbeliever, he is yet to understand that the nafs, this nafs that is an amara, it is only in control by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The doctor and the counselor and the psychologist, they have no real power. Yes, yes, after the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you find relief in medication and you find relief in some type of counsel, then it is only by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is only by whom? By the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, the point of the story is that after we have understood now that the first category, and nafs that is al-ammara, how, how should we be thinking? Yani, is this just information? Yallah, mashallah, beautiful. You should understand you should leave from this understanding that your nafs is in constant 
constant, constant battle. You are in constant battle with your nafs. Constant battle. And the nafs, it wants to win. And the shaitan, the shaitan is an aid to the transgressive nafs. It is an aid and support. So if anything, what should I take from this first category of al-anfus, wa nufus is that I should be yani, alarmed. I should be alarmed that I need to make sure that I am trying to take a way and a path to keep this nafs under control. And some people by nature, their nafs is more prone to be transgressive than others. And easy than others to transgress against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and just transgress in general. Subhanallah. And some people, subhanallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had created them in placid, placid natures. They don't have that inclination to cause harm against themselves and others. But regardless, regardless, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had told us that the nafs, it is a, a creation that loves transgression. Fa insha'Allah bi idnillah, we will talk about as we go through this insha'Allah book, different ways uh, to tame that nafs insha'Allah. Tayyib, that's the first category. Then we move on to the second category of the nafs. The second category of the nafs, as Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah also he affirmed, he said it is the nafs al-lawwamah. النفس الماذا؟ النفس اللوامة. And this نفس اللوامة, we find it in the Quran. Where Allah subhanahu wa taala says in Surah Al-Qiyam, "ولا أقسم بالنفس اللوامة." After Allah subhanahu wa taala, He starts the verse speaking about Al-Qiyam. Then He moves on, or making promise about the Qiyam. which is the day of judgment, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala moves on and speaks or he makes promise by the nafs al-lawama. Nafs al-lawama. Lama yalumu. It comes from the verb lama yalumu. When someone, when someone is blaming, blaming someone else, this word is used or this verb is used. And here, here, we used before amara, now lawama. And you can see there is a similarity because it is a constant action. So this second category of nafs, this second category of soul is the soul that is the one that is blaming, the blaming soul, subhanAllah. The blaming soul. And as we said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had promised by it in the Quran, in Surah Al-Qiyam. But what is it blaming of? What is it blaming of? As the ulama, they said that this nafs al-lawama, it is always يعني, in between two matters. The reality, it is always in between two matters. And for the believer, for the believer, it blames its soul or it blames the believer, it blames itself when what? When transgression is done. So when I'm committing a sin, and that's pretty much the majority of us. There is no one here that will put up their hand and say, I don't commit sin. The nafs al-lawama, as the ulama, they described and some of the companions like Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhu, And nafs al-lawama is every Muslim, generally, the majority. Because you know and I know when I do a sin or when I do wrong, if I am or I have the correct traits of a believer, then I blame myself. I sit down very soon and, or soon after or before I go to sleep and I say to myself, subhanAllah, why did I do that sin today? Why did I speak about that brother? Why did I take that which was not mine? Why did I lose my call today? That's the nafs al-lawama. So this is a sign from the characteristics of the believers. Don't, don't get it mistaken. Every single one of us has that, uh, uh, that type of lawm 
in us. And it is a good thing. But also, also the ulama, they said, also it is lawama, it is also blaming at times when what? When the shaitan or when the nafs wants to transgress and it's blaming you, telling you, subhanAllah, do more haram. Yes. Why didn't you do more haram? And obviously, obviously, uh, this type of blame is for the one that his iman is not high or not correct. Where the nafs it comes and it blames that person to do more haram or to, do, to transgress more. And this is apparent and it is a reality. Especially for the ones that are indulged in haram a lot or indulged in matters of transgression a lot, the nafs it wants more of that. And it tells that person, do more. Why didn't you do more? You had the chance to do more of that transgression. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from that. But more importantly for us as believers, and nafs al-lawama, it comes and it helps you, and it accounts you, and it tells you, and it blames you, hoping, in hope, inshallah, that you return back from uh, that transgression that you're doing. And you make repentance from that transgression that you have done. And you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you. So an nafs al-lawama is a very popular uh, type of nafs. Okay? All of us, or the vast majority of us, uh, we experience this. And as we said, for the believer it is a good thing. But we might ask ourselves, what is the connection? What is the connection between Al-Qiyamah? Because we took uh, the Surah, Surah Al-Qiyamah. What is the connection between the Day of Judgment and the Surah, Surah Al-Qiyamah and the Nafs? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala لا أقسم بيوم القيامة and also هي ولا أقسم بالنفس اللوامة why? for the ulama they spoke about this they said there is different reasons from them that this nafs this nafs itself the only time that the reality would be uncovered about the condition of your soul is when? is on the day of judgment is on the day of judgment so the severity of the day of judgment and the severity of the account of the nafs, it is no strange thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had connected them together. Had connected them together, subhanAllah. So that is one reason from the reasons the ulama, they said there is a connection there in this surah, in these first two ayat. Also, that in relation to the first point as well, that the hisab the hisab on the day of judgment would be for the nafs. It won't be for the body. It would be for the nafs. That is the correct understanding. And this is uh, yani something uh, that is known and it is in relation to the first point as well. And the last point here, why is al-qiyamah in connection with the nafs al-lawama or the nafs itself? Is that the nafs the nafs al-lawama, the blameworthy nafs, it is in the dunya. It is in this life. It is in this life. So when your nafs is doing that blaming, it is in this dunya. Either hoping you to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by blaming you, or either motivating you to do more haram. And the nafs, in regarding to the hisab, it is for the day of judgment. All of these points have uh, similar relations or connections, subhanAllah. Al-Hasan al-Basri, rahimahullah, he said, describing the mu'min, describing the believer and describing the nafs, and describing the nafs al-lawama. He said what? He said, إِنَّ الْمُؤْمِنْ لَا تَرَهُ إِلَّا لَائِمًا لِنَفْسِهِ وَهِيَ النَّفْسَ الَّتِي تَلُومُ so here this nafs, Al-Hasan al-Basri, he's telling us what? He's saying that the nafs of the believer, if you really want to find a person and find the correct characteristics of a believer, then you realize from him he's always worried, she's always worried about their actions. 
they're always blaming themselves. Maybe not to you apparently, but you can see or you might hear or you might know that subhanAllah this brother or this sister, they're always subhanAllah worried about their actions, worried that they need to do more, worried that if their actions are accepted of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or worried from small sins that the majority of people don't even look at. They shoo away like a fly. But to this individual, they find that mountains are on their back due to the small sins. And here Al-Hasan al-Basri, he's giving us a standard. He's telling us that if you want to measure yourself and know if you have a strong characteristic of a believer, then you will be a person that blames yourself or is very weary of the actions that you do. And that, that, is, that is clear. The Prophet, the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam spoke about that in many places. And Umar radiallahu anhu, he told us a famous statement in regarding to this, in connection. حَاسِبُوا مَاذَا أَنفُسَكُمْ قَبْلَ أَن تُحَاسَبُوا huh? Judge yourself before you are judged. مُحَاسَبَةُ nafs. And again, the ulama have written, uh, written uh, books and volumes about uh, the accounting of the soul and the accounting of the nafs. Inshallah, if we have time and Allah gives us life, inshallah, we will go into that, inshallah. So this is a very beautiful statement from uh, um, Al-Hasan for us to measure, to understand. Are we very lax when it comes to the dunya and when it comes to whatever things that we have done? Yalla, alhamdulillah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ghafur rahim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, don't worry, it's only small. It's, only, it's not a big deal, habibi. Wallah, it's not. There's people that are worse than us. There's people that are murderers. There's people that are this. There's people that are that. If you have developed that character and it's easy for you to have that character, take a step back and think to yourself, am I really looking at myself and accounting myself properly and saying, no, you know what? I am blameworthy. I need to change. I need to change myself. I need to have some type of blame. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He described the soul, al nawwama and we might ask ourselves, is it only the Muslim that is going to have a portion of this blame? No, even the kafir. Even the kafir, he has a blameworthy soul. But more so where? But more so where? We know in Surah An-Naba, وَيَقُولُ الْكَافِرُ What, what does he say? يَا لَيْتَنِي كُنْتُ تُرَابًا فَهِيَا the kafir on the Day of Judgment, also has a blameworthy soul. But more so that blame is going to be seen on the Day of Judgment. Is going to be seen when? On the Day of Judgment. When it's too late. It's better for you to blame yourself as a believer in this dunya. And it's better for you to account yourself in this dunya. And assess your actions. And your deeds. And your speech. And the things that you do. Before you get to the day of judgment. Because the blame and the regret and the sorrow should be on the day of judgment only for the one that didn't believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and didn't follow the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yani, blaming yourself and accounting yourself is a trait that should be the trait of every single believer. Subhanallah. Then we move on to the third and last and final category. Mind you, the ulama, they categorized the nafs into more than just three. But we are taking these three because they are the most popular, subhanAllah. And the last one is an-nafs al mutma'inna. The nafs that is mutma'in. The itma'inan of the nafs. The nafs that is happy and relaxed. Happy and relaxed. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Fajr. Ya ayyuhatu al-nafs al-mutma'inna. What is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say after that? Irji'i, return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are happy and you are pleased from yourself, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From the position that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. This is the soul that is mutma'in. 
And this category, this third and last category, is the category of the one that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed him or her or them with a heart that is at yani, pure health. Pure health. The vast majority of their life, their heart is mutma'in. The heart is relaxed. Their heart is happy with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is easy for them to do the khayr. It is easy for them to stay away from the sharr. It is easy for them to uh, repel the evil. It is easy to make tawbah. It is easy to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has asked us to ask of him. But unfortunately, unfortunately, the nafs al-mutma'inna, it is not easily attained. It is not easily attained. And it is something that needs constant work. And it needs constant dua of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from these people, inshallah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from them. But here, a very important point, the ulama, they said, that the nafs al-mutma'inna, it can never be attained except by, first and foremost, the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The constant remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us this in the Qur'an. الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَتَطْمَئِنُّ قُلُوبُهُمْ بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ this is from the characteristics and the signs of a heart that is relaxed and happy and peaceful with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That what? That when they remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their hearts are at ease. There is no way that I can achieve an nafs al mutma'inna. Unless I am closely remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or I'm continuously yani, remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he spoke about a dhikr in many different places. And he spoke about remembering the destroyer of pleasures in many different places. أَكْثِرُ مِنْ ذِكْرِ هَذَا مِنْ Increase, increase in the remembrance of the destroyer of pleasures. Why? Because when you remember the destroyer of pleasures a lot, then your heart, believe it or not, it becomes mutma'in. It becomes relaxed. It becomes at ease. It becomes at peace. How? This is a scary thing you might ask. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sending the angel of death to take my soul? Yes, it, it is. It is a scary thought. But the point of the story is that when you are constantly remembering Allah, remembering the Akhirah, then you are remembering the reality. You are remembering the reality that you are leaving this dunya. And your heart becomes relaxed. Why? Because you understand that reality. And you understand what it is that you need to be doing in this life. And you accept Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. And you continue on your path. Just as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he did... Uh, do and how he taught the companions radiallahu anhum طيب. the next topic that we want to speak about inshallah but we will leave it inshallah to next lesson but I will briefly just introduce the topic inshallah so we can know what it is we want to know inshallah bi'idnillah how how can I achieve how can I achieve a heart that's mutma'in? And how can I achieve a heart that's salim, that's pure and healthy? All of this information that we've taken today is great, it's fantastic. But we need to understand what is the path to get there? What is the path for me, inshallah, to achieve this heart al mutma'in and this heart that is salim? And how do I, inshallah, take those steps? So, inshallah, bi'idnillah, we'll leave that for next uh, lesson, inshallah.
The topic will be how to achieve a heart that's uh, mutma'in and how to achieve a heart that is salim and pure, inshallah. We'll leave it there, inshallah, to return and continue our next lesson, hoping in the next two weeks, inshallah, أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروا إنه هو الغفور الرحيم والسلام عليكم